Uh, I'm Brendan. I'm, I work at Google, and uh, I'm working on ASI, address-based isolation. Um, so nothing to do with um, memory tearing today. Um, oh dear. Okay. Um, CPU vulnerabilities. Um, there are lots of them, and uh, they have confusing names. We don't have a very good vocabulary to discuss them. Um, for lots of them, we don't have any vocabulary to discuss them because we don't know about them yet. Um, mitigations are also quite confusing. There are quite a lot of them. Um, and when I joined the security team, I, I spent a lot of time like reading papers and stuff and trying to get this into my head. Um, and you can do it. You can like, you can have all this in your head at once and understand it, and like still live life and like make progress on other things. Um, but it feels pretty bad um, because like. We're like really on the. We're in a very like reactive posture with these vulnerabilities. It's like a new bug comes up, you have like a um, what's it called embargo window when you can like come up with a new like bespoke mitigation for that bug. I haven't been in that position, but I hear it's a pretty bad time. So um, ASI is kind of like a big attempt to um, take back the initiative um, on this situation. Um, so just to, oh the colours aren't there. Okay, so just a very simplified overview of how many of these exploits work. Um, the attacker, which might be like user space or a VM, does some magic instruction stream to set up the microarchitectural branch predictor state. Oh, that's annoying. Um, and then uh, enters the kernel virus, this call or whatever. Um, and then because of the careful setup that the attacker did, the CPU is going to misspeculate, access some secret data, and then um, the CPU is going to figure out that that was misspeculation, roll back the instruction, but the data leaves some residue in the microarchitecture, um, which the attacker can then recover. So, like a classic example of that would be that um, of the residue would be that the speculation loaded from an address that depended on some secret value, um, and even though that's rolled back, the cache entry still remains, and so the attacker can do some timing tricks to like recover some bits of the address that was loaded from, and from there you can infer some bits of the secret. Um, so, some, like, from a defensive point of view, there are like, a lot of opportunities we have to intervene here. And one of the key ones is that that misspeculation where we load data that was a secret, that can't happen if the data isn't mapped. Because it would have to be in the TLB and the CPU doesn't know if loading it would have some side effect, right? Um, that's how um, KRSI, uh, sorry, KPTI works in a way. Um, and we also have these two moments in time from a temporal point of view where we can intervene. So like when we go from the attacker into the host or the, the kernel, we can clear away the constructed branch predictor state. And when we go back to the, before we go back to the untrusted code, we can um, flush like L1D or we could, I don't know, we could like blow away the TLB or something if we, if we had to. So with that, with those pieces of knowledge in mind, um, can we like construct a blanket mitigation that works for all of these bugs? So what if before we run any untrusted code, we just like blew away all of our caches and stuff, and then we run the untrusted code without any secrets mapped, and then after we run the untrusted code, we just like blew away branch predictor state. And I'm not gonna go into this, but we would also wanna switch off hyperthreading temporarily, but we don't have time to discuss that. Um, so if we could do this, then like, no more CPU bugs. Um, but this is like completely non-viable because like, you know, we need caches and branch predictors. That's important. Um, so ASI is kind of all about trying to do something like that, but very selectively. So instead of the transition being between trusted and untrusted code, we try to run some of the trusted code in the context of the untrusted code. So in like an untrusted address space, which we call the restricted address space. Um, and we detect that we need to go out of this restricted address space with a page fault which means that this isn't something that like, all of the kernel needs to be aware of. Um, it's just like, kind of transparent. Now, yeah, if we can like, draw this dotted line smartly enough, so like, we really don't have anything of security relevance mapped in the restricted address space, then this is just as powerful as that blanket mitigation I described earlier. But if we could like, also define them selectively enough so that we don't have to access them very often on kernel entries, then most of the time we don't pay this mitigation cost. So this can be like a blanket mitigation that's still like actually fast enough that you can switch it on. Um, so yeah, just some terminology. So I've already been using that terminology, but the, 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 there's the restricted address space, which doesn't have anything 
secret mapped, and the unrestricted address space is the other one. And um, we call memory that might have secrets in it sensitive memory, and non-sensitive is the reverse. And we call the transition into the restricted address space ASI enter, which is a bit like VM enter, so you're like entering a new domain. Um, so yeah, once we kind of have this, we have like, um, instead of having to think about every mitigation and for every platform having to configure and decide on the bespoke mitigations that are relevant for that platform and hope we don't make any mistakes in that complicated time consuming process, we should just be able to have one thing that does a broad class of, solves a broad class of problems and like importantly also hopefully and I think very likely solves the problems we don't know about yet. So like all of the imaginary, some imag for your entertainment, some imaginary vulnerability names. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this idea isn't new. Um, I think as far as I know, the first implementation was in Hyper-V in 2019. I think Zen has it too. I haven't researched that very much. Um, and Alexander from Oracle said it used the Hyper-V implementation as a um, inspiration for a Linux RFC, like five years ago. Um, and then a few years later, Junaid and Offer from Google, they uh, posted a new RFC, which is a bit more flexible than generic. And in the intervening time, we started working on going from that like high, high quality prototype to like running this in production. Um, and this is kind of steadily becoming at Google. It's like becoming a, a, a cornerstone of our CPU security strategy. So I guess my point there is like, this isn't a cool research project that we're going to throw on the mailing list and then run away. This is something that we have a business interest in maintaining long term. Um, and the other thing I've, I've kind of hinted at this is that it's a framework in that it's a little subsystem and the clients of that subsystem are things in the kernel that want to run untrusted code. So KVM is the obvious one. And the other one is like that niche subsystem that runs user space code, which I guess we have to do sometimes. Um, but the latter one isn't actually implemented yet, so we need to get on that. Um, so it, yeah. So to try and get a bit more physical with this, um, let's look at some page tables. So with KPTI, there's two page tables per process, per MM. Um, and ASI kind of puts a third one in between them that has more data than the user space page table, but less data than the kernel page table, which is now called the unrestricted page table. So now you have three page tables per process, or unless you switch off KPTI. Um, now this is kind of naive in this picture, because imagine your process A, there's gonna be some data which is, which we don't care as the kernel if process A can leak that data, we just don't want process B to leak that data. But with this, in this picture, process A's data isn't mapped when we're servicing a syscall for process A. Um, so process A is paying a mitigation cost for like its own data to protect itself from itself. So the kind of less naive, more advanced solution is that instead of, uh, instead of memory just being sensitive or non-sensitive, it's sensitive or locally non-sensitive or globally non-sensitive. And locally non-sensitive means we don't care if we leak it back to the process that it came from, basically. And so now each process has its own restricted page table with its own data mapped in it, as well as what's globally non-sensitive, which would be like the kernel text and stuff. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay. Um, yeah, this is really fiddly and complicated. Um, this was in Janaid's RFC. Um, Janaid's RFC was pretty big. Um, so if at all possible, I'd like to try and make progress, get stuff merged without at least a complete notion of local non-sensitivity, um, which hides a lot of problems. I hope hiding problems is a reasonable strategy as long as we bear them in mind. Um, okay, this really doesn't show up. Anyway, here's some performance data. I don't make very strong claims about this data. It's just like I ran the benchmark that I had a script to run on the platform that I had ready. Um, and it showed me exactly what I hoped it would, so <laughs> that's why I'm sharing it. But um, so up, up here at the top is um, if you switch off mitigations and you don't, so like people do this when they trust their workloads. Um, on, the, on the left there, that's, um, a mitigation that exists in the kernel that I imagine nobody ever uses on any platform, but which is kind of a bit like ASI in that it probably mitigates even the bugs on AMD that we don't know yet. Um, and it's devastating, right? So it's like a th this is um, throughput on the Redis benchmark. Um, and it's like a 30% degradation if you do that. 
Um, and then here at the bottom is uh, SafeRet, which is the mitigation for SRSO, which is like a big one last year. Um, and it's like a single digit percentage degradation. And for this workload, ASI is like in that ballpark as well. But it's as powerful as the blanket mitigation. Um, I should caveat this by saying that this is a version of ASI that only protects GFP user data. So there are still attacks you could do with this. So it's not a very fair comparison. But it, strategically, I think it's a good overview of where ASI is supposed to fit in. Um, yeah. OK. We have time. Good. So um, yeah, now I want to ask some questions and get some input. Um, yeah, so whenever I bring up ASI with anybody, the first question they have is, how do you annotate, how do you decide what's sensitive? And the kind of like facetious answer is, we decide by setting allocation flags. Um, so we've got, in the prototypes at least, all the allocators have support for managing sensitive and non-sensitive pages. Um, and you can imagine more complicated things where as well as just every call site deciding, you could say like any call to an allocator from the crypto library, let's just call any of that sensitive because it might have keys in it or something. Um, and you can, yeah, you can advance on that. And I think in the really long term, I suspect that we're going to want this to be a runtime policy. Like we're going to want to be able to change annotations without rebooting machines. But that's a long way in the future. Um, now, I said like, it was a facetious answer to, say we, to just say like, with allocation flags. Um, because the real question is like, how do you actually decide how to set those flags? Or in other words, like, we've created a new security boundary. And we have to decide where that boundary should go. We have to draw this line. And we can't like, go and look at every allocation and every static variable. Obviously, it's not feasible. So what is the default is a really, really important question. So if we, what we call an allow list, uh, we treat default as sensitive. And um, go ahead, Yosri. Yeah, just a very quick clarification. Uh, it's hard to annotate sensitivity for kernel data, but it is easy to protect sensitive data from the user space. So all user memory in the direct map can be trivially annotated and protected because the, the UGFP user. The problem here that how do we protect the sensitive data that the kernel itself allocates? Just clarifying this yeah, point. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so I think you either have to start from a position of the mitigation being incomplete, so there's some data that potentially is sensitive, but that is mapped in the restricted address space, or you have to start from something where the performance is bad. Um, oh, I should also clarify that the reason that would be the case is because if there's not very much in the restricted address space, you're going to have a lots of ASI exits, and you're going to pay that mitigation cost very often. Um, so I think if you look at this in terms of like the attributes you would want uh, a patch set to have, um, it has to be like small enough to review. I think that's non-negotiable. Um, it should be reasonably fast, and it should be like a complete mitigation. And I think you only get to start with two of these. So you can either have something that is fast, and then like work from there. Which, which realistically, I think you would have to run it alongside other mitigations, and then you can work from there towards it being um, towards it being like a, a, a total mitigation, um, and learn about the. Um, performance characteristics as you go. Um, or you can, oh yeah, and, and if you do that and you get annotations wrong, it's a security issue. Um, or you can go the other way around, uh, where you start with something that mitigates everything completely, and then you can work towards making it faster and faster. And if you take this approach and you annotate something wrong, it's a performance issue, which sounds less bad than a security issue, but it's kind of also equally scary because these are like, they can be latent issues that suddenly appear. And where it's security issues, it's like, oh no, we have to do something about this soon. Like um, performance issues are like impacting you and costing you lots of money like right now from, from like millisecond zero, right? But all these, all these security issues just make performance. Yeah, but the other ones tend to be quite a stable. So like safer at the one I showed you, that's like um, on every return you pay a small overhead. Um, and that means that it's very predictable and stable, whereas with ASI, it's a lot more sensitive to the workload and unpredictable. Yeah. Um, so, oh, yeah, that's it, actually. So, um, yeah, this is a time for input. I think, I hope people have opinions about this topic. Um, who wants to start? <laughs> Oh, 
Hari. Um, so I guess it's more of a asking a question back, which is having written a couple kernel exploits, right? I see many of these CPU side channels as mainly targeting like I would use it for figuring out KSLR and figuring out like the offset. And uh, that's one um, common use. So, but beating KSLR is really easy, and in fact, ASI makes it really, really, really easy. Like it makes it trivial. Yeah, so. I guess uh, to kind of is expand on that, like how are it kind of goes to defining the sensitive data boundary, right? Yeah. Which is there's things that are might not appear very sensitive at first, like they might not be. Uh, they might not be, um, sorry, like cryptographic keys. Yeah. But it might be things like the TRNG device pointer or yeah. things like that, yeah. um, which would be very useful in an exploit if you knew the exact memory address of that. Um, so, yeah, that's my question is which exactly what, when we say sensitive, that just seems very vague to me. Like, what is, what are you considering sensitive? Yeah, well, for this to be something that exists in the mainline kernel, it has to be anything that the um, anything that could be used to infer. I would say anything that's user space data, right? So um, we don't have to decide what's like sensitive to the user. We just have to decide what's like data that the user created or controls or cares about, right? So in the case like the ca case of the random number generator, that like is directly an input to the user space code. So that's like user data. I think that's a, one way of thinking about it. But I think what you're really saying is that it needs to be default sensitive, right? And then we need to, because I think there are cases where you can argue quite strongly that something isn't sensitive. Well, I, I'm getting more towards the, the approach to the mitigation, right? Mm -hmm. Like the approach to the mitigation is fundamentally that you are still, reliant on, say, the, you're kind of trying to solve a hardware problem with a software solution. Yeah. And I just think that tomorrow somebody's going to find some other sensitive piece of information in the kernel, then they're going to use leverage a side channel to figure it out. Um, I think much, to propose like a counter alternative, right? Like a, a kind of straw man argument. One way that you could uh, partition sensitive information is you put it into like a separate chip and you uh, like clock accesses to that chip so that they can only be uh, essentially run all your crypto algorithms in a separate SOC, right? Yeah, that's the, um, that's the proper way to solve this problem, right? So, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that I have many comments beyond that, but I'm, yes. just, I'm wondering why there's been adoption Yeah, honestly, I don't have many comments beyond that. I just don't. I just don't know that it fundamentally solves the CPU side channel problem. It solves it for the data that it solves it for, um, okay. which um, is a lot of data, and I think can be like okay. If you look at like the cloud provider use case, um, then it's easy to say like we're, we're protecting all the data that the customer owns or like writes or that influences the customer's um, execution. Um, which is quite a big thing. I still agree that this is like a workaround for the fact that we don't have a physical isolation between the attacker and the and the and the victim, right? So offloading crypto is still better than ASI. But while we have one CPU that's doing all that work, I think this is what we need. If I may add something here, uh, also while ASI may not uh, mitigate all the speculative CPU bugs. It offers a way to easily mitigate them. So, for example, in this case, maybe ASI does not by default consider this memory sensitive, but once we realize there's a problem, instead of figuring out a custom mitigation for every problem, we just add like one or two lines of code to ASI to annotate this memory as sensitive or add an action that gets executed on ASI exit, and then we fix it. So we, we are streamlining fixing or mitigating security bugs, not claiming that we have solved all of them forever, if that makes sense. And also, I would say that if, like, so finding, if your security issue is we have a, a sensitivity misannotation, that's, like, as a, as a, like, someone in the security team, I'm like, oh, we need to deploy a patch. If, some, if the bug is, oh, we have a new way that attackers can stimp speculation or a new way that attackers can um, have a, a new covert channel, then, then I'm freaking out because now I have to, that's, like, 
we have to like develop new ideas, right? So even when it doesn't mitigate things, it still improves the situation. But I think it does, it's still possible to configure it in a way where it does mitigate a very broad class of problems. We can talk offline. Yeah, yeah, let's do yeah. that. Yeah. Let's do that. Does anybody else have any? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Does it help in the other direction of if you know if a CPU can be told, like, you're in an ASI domain, like, like every single crazy speculation you can think of, go ahead, because now, like, basically, it's a, it's a go fast bit because you know that the ASI is there. Um, Sorry, I think I missed the beginning. Of the can it help in the other, direc other direction of, a, of allowing increased deployment of speculation by saying, like, this is a safe area to speculate? Yeah, that's kind of what it's all about, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, w w what, I f what I consider a little bit confusing is that we're trying to build our system with the assumption that our hardware is broken and will be broken, right? Yeah. That sounds... That sounds completely wrong to me. That's the situation we're in. Yeah, that, that's the situation. But I mean, I heard that we're streamlining, we're making it easier to fix hardware. Sh should we actually be doing that? Yes. Um, yeah, it's, so it's, it's still so, nice. So, so any hardware vendor can just give a shit and do what they want. You're going to fix it in the kernel, no problem. No, no, no. That's, that's, that's not what we're claiming. But uh, CPU bugs, especially in speculation, keep showing up. and. We keep trying to look for mitigations for every single one, and it just makes everyone's lives easier if we have an easier way to deal with this. We're not uh, saying CPU uh, vendors can do whatever they want. We're just making it easier to fix them in software until they make better hardware, I guess. Yeah, the, the issue I'm having is that like we're designing a, a system with the assumption that there will always be speculation bugs, and they will always be severe, and that's what users will care about, right? Yeah. But, but, but even, even if even not always, at least for the next 10 years while you have Geno Genoa and you have uh, whatever the next... What's the right, next that's, that's what I was going to say. Even yeah. if new hardware is completely foolproof, we have already a lot of machines lying around that are uh, exploitable. I, I see what you mean. I, I just like considering that, that everybody should, everybody should pay a performance penalty for that is something that I don't quite understand. No, this is trying to improve the performance penalty, if anything. Yeah, it's a... But, but I assume like the, the target goal is for this to run everywhere because we're afraid that there is another CPU bug. So no, it's designing a system yeah. with that in mind that our hardware is shit, so we're going to make our software shit slower. Sorry, not shit, but slower. But yeah. uh, So this is actually one really interesting <laughs> topic that I didn't have time for in the slides, which is that, so like the way I kind of described it in the slides is that we just like say, oh, we've got this like clever system that means we don't have to do it very often, so we just flush everything. But there's actually a tension there where you can kind of say, oh, well, we can actually um, tune or like go a little bit bespoke on what we do on these transitions for each platform. And that means that at least, so um, like you could say like on AMD right now in practice, this is actually, this, this flush actually isn't necessary for any bugs that we really know we have. So um, we can have a version of ASI that's tuned for a given platform and then it's still easy to like patch in that flush if we need to, even as like a live patch, um, as we discover new bugs. So it, even if you want to like try and maintain your knowledge of like strengths of particular pieces of hardware, um, it still lets you do that. And the other thing I would add that's kind of interesting and philosophical is, even if you don't have bugs where the attacker can steer speculation, you still have these attacks. Um, in theory, I don't know if anyone's actually done this in practice, but like, unless you can make the branch predictors accurate, which obviously you can't because otherwise they're not predictors anymore, um, there's always going to be misspeculation loading, potentially loading the secret. So you could always find some gadget. Um, so we're never, it's not possible in theory to have a CPU that's entirely immune to this, to this kind of exploit. And uh, the, the other question I would have is like, you mentioned the virtual machine use case, and I mean, we have this beautiful world of confidential computing with all this nice hardware. Vendors did a really good job. Um, jokes aside, wh how do you see like this? Would this still be required, for example, when you run that with TDX? Because we're still afraid that hardware might get it wrong. Uh, or Yeah, good question. I've 
people, we, we've been thinking about that, and I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thanks. It, guys, those are kind of more about protecting the guests from the host, but I think they also incidentally do the other way around, right, somehow. But, but also, I mean, the, the, there, are, there are cases where, where the, the hardware made a mistake and, and shouldn't have been looking at something and it should have been, or left, left state it shouldn't have. But like, let's remember that like, the, the, a lot of these things that people are going after, this is like in Hennessy and Patterson, like this is in your textbook, how do you build a fast CPU, you, you speculate. And so like, to your point, like, if you want, you can have a very um, secure CPU that is dog slow because it doesn't try to speculate at all. So you're, you're always having to pay some costs to speculate. Yeah. And there's also this, like, the side channels kind of can't, you can't just, like, say, let's not have any side channels because you, then you have to throw away work that you're doing speculatively, um, and that's almost as bad as not speculating in a way. Uh, I'm, that's not quite true, but it's also impossible to fix in a principled way in the hardware. Yeah, we also have that problem with the, the, uh, the do it M market, like, basically, Timing independent instructions that like instructions that have gu guaranteed time of execution, like that 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 will take away side channels, but also takes it also takes away your performance. Yeah. Um, any more input on like so? I'd I'd love to hear like what people think about how we approach this to like get code merged and start making progress in tree instead of out of tree. Um, of the two, I don't know. Maybe we could have like a show of hands of like. Uh, of the two approaches, do we start fast or do we start secure? What, or does anybody have any strong opinions about that? I was, I was just going to say, like, I remember it really depends who you talk to. Like, if, if you, if the people that are, yeah, the security people, like, security matters. Every, and then you talk to, like, the net dev people, and they say, no, like, if it's not performant, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's secure. Well, yeah, and I think in this case, ASI is pointless if it's not both in the end. So it's just a question of how we where we start from, right? Um, not a question of where we're going. Because if it's, if it's not fast and it's not secure, then, or it's not secure, then we, ha we have unsecure and we have fast already, so, yeah. I mean, like, uh, let me ask you, like, what, what pushback have you, like, I mean, are, are, you, are these discussions on the list that you're asking like, to have an in-room in kind of vote on which way we should go, or is it the case where you, you kind of feel like which way you want to go and you're trying to well, uh, get permission uh, like to do it? My, Instinct is that we should start with something that's secure, um, but uh, I'm not wed to that. Um, and I'll do whatever lets us start making progress in the tree, right? Um, but if it's optional, you can turn it off. Then I don't, I don't understand why you couldn't start here. What, why can't you start here? Um, well, the strat the, to put on my other shoe and be the other person, I would say, like, if you don't have something that performs from the start, you're not learning the lessons about how you make things fast. Right, so you're not seeing how it impacts real workloads because you're just like, oh, it's slow, it doesn't matter. But yeah, I agree, this would be my preferred place to start, I think, but uh, Yosri? If, if it's slow, people are less likely to use it and test it as well, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a motivation for people to use it if it is performant. Yeah, the, it, it, uh, even better than being able to work in tree would be able to work in tree on something people are running. Um, yeah. Yeah. Someone at the back? I think it's probably easier to, to measure regressions in performance than security. That's definitely true, yeah. So. yeah. But the same is true, like it's easier to measure performance improvements than it is to measure security improvements, right? Like, He's asking for a start. But I feel like if you offer something that actually gives you security, then that's actually a value. If you offer something that isn't secure and is a performance cost, why would anyone turn that on any, either? Right, like. Also, arguably, if um, also arguably, if you start performant with uh, not everything mitigated, you have mit standalone mitigations that you can use while you get there. But the other way can't work. You can't start with something slow and mitigate it. I mean, like but we, we we saw we saw the development of Red Pauline was a. Let's start with let's start with secure and people saying this the security is, is great, but like it needs to be performant and then Repolin came along. So I feel like we innovate like the kernel community is motivated to innovate around performance versus innovate on security, which is harder. So to Jason's point. Yeah, and it kind of feels like it's easier to make like so if we've got something that's slow and then I can come along with another patch set and say now it's five percent faster. That's easy for me to justify. Um, and we can make much more like concrete forward steps on performance, whereas if I have to come and be like, now I'm improving security on this, which I want to prioritize 
for my own reasons that you might not agree with, that's more difficult to make progress on, I think. Have you talked with Case Cook about? Uh, not for a long time, actually. I mean, like, I, I think he deals with, deals with this problem, too, about, about how to get the kernel to digest his security features. And it really is along the lines of this adds security, and, but people say, like, come back when it's performance. But I, th I, th I think starting from the security standpoint is, like, th that's the whole point, and then, and then you can innovate yeah. on performance. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, thanks. Thank you.